been a few weeks since the Anti has featured on the, on the channel. In fact, it's been a few weeks since I've actually done a video in England. So since you've last seen this car, we've picked up a GT3 RS, courtesy of Trading 212. We've done a video in a Pagani Huayra. We've flown a Pagani Zonda F from Dubai to Italy, and I dropped my 100th video and celebrated in style by driving one of my all-time favorite roads. So if you haven't seen any of those videos, be sure to uh, look back through and indulge in those. But we're back, we're back in the LT. Today, I'm gonna discuss something that I very rarely discuss, and that is things that I actually don't like about cars, and specifically today, this car. Now, once again, regular viewers of this channel will know that this car, since the very moment I stepped in it in Tenerife, to the few weeks after where I was compelled to purchase one, you know how much I love this thing. It has absolutely recalibrated my appreciation for cars and what a road-going supercar can do. But of course, with all cars, nothing is perfect. And typically, I judge my experience with a car by how many miles that I've driven it, not necessarily how long that I've owned it for. And so the LT, I've had it for maybe four or five months. Uh, but in that time, I've done, well, 5,224.2 miles in it. Um, and yeah, in that time, I've got to know this car fairly well. For all of its glory, for all of its fabulous, fantastic properties and emotions that it gives me, it has now become time that I highlight a few issues that they may be personal, they may be factual, that I think can either be improved or are just character traits of this car. So where do we start? I'm only going to pick five, and I'll be honest, before I get into it too much, this car is so good that I struggle to find five. But there are five things that they don't depress me about this car. It's not like a huge problem. They're more characteristics and traits of it because of what it is. It is a focused, fairly hardcore supercar. But as a trade-off with this thing being so driver-focused, there are things which at times can be a bit of a pain in the ass. And I'm going to start with the first thing, which brings me to a point where I'm going to slow up right now, which is the turning circle. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to give it a go. Now, we're on a, a sort of main road. It's probably not the widest road in England, but it's not the tightest either. And I'm just going to try and do a... Th well, it's going to... I would say a three-point turn here. But uh, chances are it's going to be a lot more than I can tell already just looking at this curb here that this is going to be an issue. Because the LT, for all of its fantastic steering feel, lock-to-lock -lock ability, it's... Yeah. It's kind of like being in a Le Mans car. See, my wheel's on the curb now. How many turns is that? That's two. Front splitter might hit the front. Now I'm like, okay, I'm blocking the road now, actually straddling both lanes. I can't see the front of the curb. I don't want to take my front splitter off because this is also probably one of the lowest cars that I've ever owned as well. Is that gonna, nope. <laughs> Yeah, so when I tell you this, I'm not exaggerating when I say the turning circle isn't great. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, so as you can see, when you're in situations where you might have to make something like a three-point turn, that scene from Austin Powers comes to mind. just the price you have to pay for having a steering rack that when you do get up to speed is fantastically fast. Personally, I am willing to accept the compromise in order to have a phenomenal steering experience once I am, you know, for example, up in the Alps or something like that. Number two isn't something that I can demonstrate right now, but I will talk about it. Fortunately, right now, we're driving in an incredibly beautiful, sunny England. 
And during the daytime, fantastic. Nighttime, the headlights on the LT, they just aren't up to it. When the sun goes down and you're piloting this thing fairly swiftly on a country road, you need the road to be well lit. And I don't know what it is about these headlights. I can't decide if they're not bright enough or if the angle of them isn't right. The projection and trajectory of the beam doesn't project far enough down the road for you to comfortably anticipate what is coming. Now, I have in fact taken this car back to my dealer and asked them if they can tweak it. They said they could, but when I got it back, I didn't see much of a change. Now, I'm not sure if that's my car specifically, but uh, yeah, I'd be interested in fact to talk to other LT owners to see if they've experienced a similar thing. But in my experience, headlights, they don't quite illuminate the road just in eyes. Now, I consider myself to be a young, fairly fit, flexible dude, but when I get it in and out of this car, it can be a pain at times, and that's predominantly because of this big sill. Now, again, with these cons come pros. We are in a phenomenal full carbon tub. The chassis dynamics, the weight of this car, it's all a fantastic thing that is very focused on driving. And if you're only going to get in and out of this car, you know, once or twice a journey, it's not so bad. When I'm, I'm filming, I'm in and out of this car a lot. Like I'm, I'm out changing camera angles, setting up various things. And I find that when you jump in and out of it frequently, you better get yourself a good technique to get in and out because after a while, it just becomes quite a chore to step over this big sill. I do think that if you weren't that flexible, I do think that getting in and out might be a problem for the older gent, maybe. Which is why the 570S is so fantastic because they've still maintained this beautiful, rigid, lightweight carbon tub, but they've sculpted this entry point down so you can swing your legs in and out a lot easier. Okay, number four. Now I've spoken about this before on a previous car, the cup holders. Now, let's face it, we don't just use cup holders for holding cups. In this day and age, it's the space for your phone, for your keys, whatever else you bring with you on a daily basis. The cup holder is a holding space. Now, as beautiful as the design of the interior of this car is, it does have this big bridge here, and it's a nice carbon-faced bridge, and it looks awesome and space-agey, and I love the fact that it integrated the uh, sat-nav and infotainment screen in a vertical layout. That's really nice. It looks cool. Now, the trade-off for that is the cup holders and the basic sort of handy space is behind and underneath this bridge, which for getting cups in and out, especially if, the, if they've got something in them, pain in the ass, all of these things that I've mentioned aren't big problems. But I thought I'd make this video because the more I'm using it, the more these things are starting to come to light. And I thought, you know what, if you watch this channel regularly, all I ever do is sing this thing's praises every time I get in it. I'm like, oh my God, this is perfect. And it very nearly is. It very, very nearly is. Final point, fifth and final point, the front axle lift on the 675 LT. Now, first of all, I've seen LTs which haven't been specced with the option in the first place. And on a lot of cars, I've found that that hasn't always been a problem. This is by far the lowest car I have ever owned. It, it, it's, it makes a 458 feel like an SUV. Honestly, it's, it is that low that even when the, the front axle lift does work, there have been times where my front end has still scraped. Now, sometimes that is purely part and parcel of owning a supercar, but most of the time, front axle lifts on other cars these days allow you to get around the majority of scrapes. First thing is, that doesn't always happen with this car because it is so low. Even with the front axle lift up, it does still scrape sometimes. But the most annoying thing of all is, the speed of which the front axle lift activates is desperately slow. Sometimes you don't always know when you're going to need to activate this front lift 
you'll be driving somewhere which you don't regularly drive and all of a sudden you'll come across a speed bump or a dip or something and you need to get this thing on quick. Now, the GT3's axle lift is the fastest in the game. I believe uh, it operates off a compressed air pump. So when you press the button, it just goes straight up and it just, it's just on. And equally, when you want it to go back down, you press it again, it depletes the air and it just goes and the whole car just drops down. Fantastic. The LT, I think, is on a screw thread. Now, McLaren might have done this to save weight, maybe. I don't know what their reason for it is. But when you want to activate the lift on this, you better have time. <laughs> because it's like you press it and it just goes like this and you're waiting and you're waiting and, it, and it's going and it's going and it's going. Sounds trivial again. Sometimes though I've found myself where I'm holding up traffic because I'm starting to raise up my front lift to get over a bump. And that's, uh, yeah, that's just the way it is. Now, now I feel like I've just slagged this car off for the last 10 minutes. So uh, let me redeem things by just having a quick blast and a pedal to just reassure you that regardless of everything that I've just said, out of the box, <laughs> this, this thing is it's just crazily fantastic. It is emotionally stunning, aesthetically phenomenal, and I love it to bits. But those are the quirks that sometimes, uh, yeah, when you live with it on a day-to-day -day basis, isn't always so awesome. To make up for it, I'm going to point you guys forward, have a quick squirt, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching, guys. Ciao. Everything I've just said.